This is the first uh, inaugural lecture in what, I, what we're calling our Provost Lecture Series. Um, the concept here is that there are many challenges going on around us, uh, be they political, financial, or even an academic medical center. But I have a quote here from Marie Curie who once said, nothing in life is to be feared, it's only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we, so that we may fear less. I believe that uh, one of the most productive things, proactive things that we can do in academic medicine, uh, especially in these times, is to share ideas and opinions and knowledge. Uh, so over the course of this Provost Lecture Series, we'll be bringing in people that are experts, they're uh, uh, known for their knowledge and expertise, um, uh, opinion leaders, but also you might even suggest that some of these folks are going to be disruptive thinkers. I think that all of these things are good. The concept is that the more we know, the more we see, the more we learn, the more likely we are to continue to be successful. So on that note, I'm particularly honored to uh, welcome Dr. Ross McKinney uh, as our first Provost Lecturer. Uh, he is the Chief Scientific Officer for the Association of American Medical Colleges. Uh, in that role, Dr. McKinney leads programs that support medical research and training. He also represents the AMC, AAMC nationally and internationally on issues related to research and science, including policy, uh, administrative oversight, workforce development, education, and training. Before joining the AAMC last year, Dr. McKinney worked uh, in, uh, at Duke University where he, had, where he held various roles. Uh, he was at Duke for about three decades. Uh, his responsibilities there included being director of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases, vice dean for research, and he was also director of the Trent Center for Bioethics, Humanities, and the History of Medicine. Among his, among his many accomplishments over his career, Dr. McKinney was first author of a key phase one and actually key several phase one and phase two studies on the role of AZT in children. Uh, over his career, he's been widely recognized for his contributions on the natural history, prevention, and treatment of pediatric HIV disease. He has more than 200 publications, over 30 uh, book chapters. Uh, he serves on the editorial board of the American Journal of Bioethics, and he's been recognized as one of America's top doctors for 16 consecutive years. Uh, despite these many accolades, as I was thinking about one more characteristic I wanted to highlight, I'm going to borrow a, a phrase from popular culture. And I'll say this, um, of all the souls I've known, Dr. McKinney's is one of the most human. So we're delighted to have him here today. Dr. McKinney, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, that's quite an honor. And, and I'm honored to be here, first of all. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you are interested, I hope, in the topic of trying to figure out where we are going to go with scientific research, because these are challenging times. So the, the way this talk will work is that I'm going to talk about some of the successes that, that represent why science is so exciting and why what we do matters so much. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the scientific challenges that we're confronting, problems that are cultural and um, logistical. Then I'll talk a little bit about the funding situation, since the AAMC is there representing um, UTMB and other schools in um, advocating for research funding at the um, uh, NIH level or for the NIH. And then I'll talk a little bit about what I think are some of the community goals and places we want to be in terms of research. So it's important to begin with my conflict of interest notices. Um, I'm employed by the Association of American Medical Colleges, so I represent um, medical schools and academic medical centers in my daily job. Uh, I have an unpaid consulting relationship with the National Football League Players Association, for which I do uh, research ethics. And I'm also an unpaid member on several data safety monitoring boards for Gilead Sciences, who develop, um, in my case, nucleoside um, drugs for treatment of hepatitis B and HIV. <clears throat> so we're at an amazing point in the history of science. Um, we're at the early stages of what I think is going to be a really profound genomic and genetic revolution, understanding the biology of how a lot of diseases happen in a totally different way. And, and as part of that, the feds are trying to get data from across the United States and ultimately around the world in a program called um, the All of Us Research Program, where they're going to be sampling um, genomic information and 
linking it to clinical records. And this raises issues about how we're going to do human subjects research in the future that I'm not going to talk about today, but it's another talk that I like to give. Um, we're starting to see the first genetic treatments that are curative for single gene diseases, and they're actually being licensed, um, and I'll talk about a few of those. And average life expectancy is at a near record high. And, and this is the life expectancy in the United States, and you can see how it's just gone up, 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 except for this one little blip, which was the Spanish influenza of 1916. And it's pretty striking, the amazing effect that had on life expectancy. And it's the sort of reason that we have facilities like the one that you have here, so that we don't see another episode like that. But with those successes in life expectancy, we also get really interesting questions. So for example, the average person in the United States has a life expectancy at birth of 78.6 years. This was from 2010. Um, and that's about the same as what the life expectancy is for, for whites. But Asian Americans live a median of 87.3 years as a life expectancy. That's pretty striking. That's a pretty striking above the, the mean. And for African Americans, it's down to 74.3 years, which is actually better than it was because um, we've, there has been an impact on some of the causes of death and some of the reasons that people die prematurely. Now, this is a complicated slide, and I'm just going to breeze over it. What you should notice is, you know, what people die of, white folks die of, is cancer and circulatory ailments. Mostly. There are other things, but those are the biggies. Um, if we look at early deaths in the African-American community, there's this infection. And actually, the circulatory, you can't tell it, but the circulatory deaths are earlier than they are in the white population. So we need to understand what is the reason for this difference. And these are in rates. This is not total numbers. This is rates. Um, so people are dying when they die, when they die early, either of HIV or of um, circulatory ailments at a higher rate in the African-American community. Overall, we've made profound differences in, in heart disease deaths. It's pretty striking, because you, you could see heart disease going up, up, up. This is total number of deaths going up, 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 and actually falling. Well, cancer just keeps relentlessly going up as we age, because cancer and age, obviously, are very closely associated. Um, there are different reasons that you might be able to explain that change in cardiac deaths. And one perspective that was actually in the New England Journal in 2012 was that we've done great by our development of technology and new ideas. And so things like, you know, here we see beta blockers and cabbage, and shortly after the first description of cabbage, you start to see this roll-off. I'll bet you it had very little to do with that roll-off. Um, it's not the reason that we got such a, a big change. I think, actually, this was the wrong view. The right view was this one. This is the public health view of the same data. And you look at, oh, Surgeon General's report on smoking, Cigarette Smoking Act, and you could see a similar, I'll bet you that by far the primary driver of why we have so many fewer cardiac deaths is um, the change in smoking patterns. While we have those successes, there are also failures in, in the serving our population that we're trying, whose health we're trying to improve. And the one that's been recognized recently, that was sort of unexpected, was recognized by Ann Case and Angus Deaton. He's the 2015 Nobel Laureate in Economics. And um, here we have, now this is not an apples to apples comparison, so be careful not to look at it as an apples to apples comparison. Um, here was the success in, this is deaths per 100,000, so it's mortality rate by year. And what you can see is there's been a very significant decrease in black non-Hispanic mortality. This is a real public health success. So, so we haven't reached equity yet, but there actually is real progress. <clears throat> the Hispanic mortality, is considerably below. And in fact, Hispanic mortality is considerably below the white mortality rates. 
which many people find um, unexpected, but may reflect what's referred to as the immigrant um, effect, that new immigrants, it's a selected population, they tend to be healthier and so have a better life expectancy. Um, and there's a slow rise, actually, in white, not Hispanics. But there's a big rise in 45 to 50-year-old whites who did not have a, call or a high school, who not completed uh, no more than a high school education. So sort of pre-college, non-college graduates um, are dying at an ever-increasing rate, and it's a very impressive change. So this is a challenge for us to understand. And, and what we had, can see in the epidemiology of this is it's sort of happening across this belt. It's happening all over, but this rate, the change from, 20, from 2000 to 2014 in all-cause mortality is really concentrated here in the central United States. Um, and so what is the cause? What are? We don't know. But there are some things we can associate with it. For example, it really is considered to be diagnoses of despair. Most of that rise is attributable to um, alcoholic liver failure, narcotic overdose, and suicide. So we have a part of our population that is not being well served by our public health, by our desire to, to improve everybody's quality of life. There clearly is a group who is not being served well. Um, on the other hand, let's talk about some real medical successes. <clears throat> so this is the one I know the most about of these various topics, because I did HIV work. So HIV epidemic was really first described um, as a disease. HIV was described as a disease, not called HIV then, but um, in 1981, when Michael Gottlieb at UCLA reported six cases of pneumocystis carinii pneumonia in previously healthy gay men. New disease, worthy of mention in the Mortality and Morbidity Weekly Report from the CDC. Um, in 1982, the first pediatric cases were described. And um, in 1985, the first phase one study of AZT. That's a pretty rapid turnaround, actually. It's pretty impressive, four years. from, And it's because um, Burroughs Welcome found a nucleoside that had been a failed anti-cancer drug in their library that turned out to have antiretroviral properties. Um, and they were screening mechanisms. First, you had to identify the virus so you could grow it. Then they measured the reverse transcriptase activity. And in fact, this was stuff, work that was done, some of it at uh, Duke by Kent Weinhold and Tom Matthews, who were working on trying to have models uh, in order to demonstrate the effect of antiretroviral drugs to see which ones might work. They were the first to really see the effect of AZT um, but they had been sent it by Burroughs Welcome as part of a series of compounds to screen. So, quick progress. Um, the first children got AZT in 1986, in October 1986. Um, she, they actually got it at Duke, um, and I was part of that team. And at that point, when we started, the life expectancy for an HIV-infected child was three and a half years. So, it was a very bad disease. And mother-to-child transmission was 25%. Well, a series of trials done in fairly rapid order using new drugs developed by the pharmaceutical companies working with a clinical trials network that was funded by the NIH <clears throat> was able to very rapidly advance the state of the art. And you go from 1981, where it's first described, 1985, first effective drug. By 1992, we understand what we need to know in order to have a really almost complete recovery of the immune system if you treat early enough and soon enough. Now, it took a while to get, that was where we had the technology. It took a while to actually figure out the, the nuances, but now the life expectancy for HIV-infected children is that they're gonna go into adulthood. And most of the kids that I was taking care of when I left practice to go to the AAMC were going off the adult clinic with normal immune systems. It was a remarkable change. So I go from three and a half year life expectancy to kids going off to college. Um, kids going off. Actually, one of my all-time highlight questions, one of my patients raised by a drug-using mom, not very good mom, single mom, rural North Carolina, crummy school system. One of the all-time highlights was when she asked me, um, Dr. McKinney, do you think it'll be okay if I go out of state to grad school? 
That's a career highlight. Um, she did. <clears throat> she now works in one of the hospitals in North Carolina. Um, the mother-to-child transmission is now less than 1% from 25%. That's remarkable. We can, we can block transmission where we have the resources. And in the United States, we have the resources. In the developing world, the resources are still not there. The health systems are not there. The mortality is still higher than it should be. Um, we went from complex cocktails. I remember Jim Oleski showing a plate of all the medicines that the typical patient was taking in the early 90s to now it's one pill once a day and it'll last for decades probably. And, and even better, it looks like very soon we're gonna have depot medication. So you get one injection once a month, which to my mind with our teenagers be really good because it's really hard to get a teenager to take their medicines. Um, and so we're making really important strides. I am a pediatrician, and, and so I've seen quite a few patients who had severe combined immunodeficiency. So that's a syndrome, that's the bubble baby, if you remember from, um, from Baylor, where the baby, the child had no immune system and had to be kept isolated um, because anything, anything could be potentially a pathogen. Well, the worst form of SCID has been ADA-deficient SCID because it's been resistant to bone marrow transplantation. But it's a single gene defect. It, it's, a, it's an inability to uh, clear um, uh, adenosine. It's an adenosine DNA, deaminase um, deficiency. And um, what they have found is that they can insert the gene using a retrovirus into the kid's own cells, and it's curative. Um, so you can take a single gene defect, insert that gene using a retrovirus, and now we're able to give the child a normal life, at least as far as we can see. They've treated, I believe, about eight, what's 18 children. It's licensed, um, but the trouble is it does cost $650,000 for that single dose. Another really bad disease, metachromatic leukodystrophy. This was a terrible disease. Have you ever seen a kid that had it? It's a slow brain rot with generalized neurological deterioration. And what they found is that if um, they found a study, they studied children who were siblings of children who had metachromatic leukodystrophy. They identified if they had the defective gene. If they had the defective gene and they gave them, again, an autologous transplant using genetically modified cells as rescue, they could cure it, so the kid never developed the disease. You have to find it shortly after birth. You have to be early. Um, but again, it's just an amazing proposition that we have these diseases that were lethal, that were awful, that led to terrible quality of life, and we can cure them. And so we're going to march through, I predict, the single gene defects and be able to cure them. And sickle cell eventually, I mean, we're gonna find cures for diseases like that using this sort of strategy. Um, there are currently about 2,000 trials ongoing of gene therapy because they're marching through. And the targets have included things like Wiscott Aldridge syndrome, which is a faulty, another single gene defect, retinal diseases like um, Leber's um, uh, ocular dystrophy, um, adrenal leukodystrophy, sickle cell anemia, um, chronic granulomatous disease, Pompe's disease. I mean, the list goes on. And I just find this absolutely incredible because for a pediatrician who saw these weird kids come in to our center, we're making, we have curative therapies just on the brink. It's an amazing proposition. So again, the cool part of science. Another cool frontier that we're just touching at the end is cancer and immunotherapy. Um, normal cells have a program death ligand, PD-L1, on their surface. And when the PD-1 from a CD8 cell binds to it, um, it downregulates CD8 activity and protects the normal cells. Cancer cells are really clever. They have a lot more of the um, PD-L1 ligand on their surface, so they're more protected. And what we've got now are drugs that are able to bind to the PD-L1 ligand and inactivate it so that the CD8 cells can actually kill the tumor cells. And it, it affects the tumor cells which are enriched with this ligand um, to a greater degree. So it, whole new strategies for treating tumors are available. And there are three different drugs that are all now licensed 
using this as a strategy. And I think we've all seen the pictures of Jimmy Carter, who had um, metastatic melanoma in his brain and liver metastases, treated um, with Merck's um, PDL1 inhibitor. And as of December of 2015, um, his scans were reported to be lesion free. That's absolutely incredible. I mean, metastatic melanoma? You can actually make a dent? I mean, I personally find this incredible. And, and so things like that are the exciting part of science. We are making a difference in people's lives. So there's lots of good news in what we are doing in science. It is a really remarkable time. We can do cool stuff, um, but I'm now going to consider what are some of the obstacles that we're confronting as a community. And, and then we'll discuss how collectively we might be able to best serve the public good. So here are the challenges that I've identified as sort of on the forefront that we should talk about. Reproducibility, bias in research, the funding challenges we face, the myth factor, and by the myth factor, I'm referring to the fact that some people think that science is a myth, and, and maintaining the public's trust. So let's start with reproducibility. And, and I like this quotation. If a finding is true, but it's only true with one cell line, and it has to be in a Boston zip code, and the Red Sox won the night before, it may be true, but it's not very robust. A lot of what we have done in research looks this way. And, and we need to change the culture so that we are more rigorous about what we publish. Just because you find P05 does not mean that you have an important finding. It shouldn't even mean that you have a publication, but that seems to be the general sense. So there was a group called the Reproducibility Project based at the University of Virginia, the Open Science Collaborative, and they tried to reproduce 100 published experiments in psychology. 97% of the studies had statistically significant results in the original article, and they tried to replicate it working with the original investigators. On replication, 36% of the studies had statistically significant results. 97%, 36%, doesn't look very good. 47% um, of the results were within the 95% confidence interval of the original study. That doesn't give you a very high degree of confidence in a lot of the psychology research. And this was all in major peer-reviewed journals. 39% of the second studies were subjectively judged to have replicated the initial study. 60% didn't. The studies with stronger initial relationships, higher, lower p-values, were more frequently reproducible. Uh, but the mean effect size, even in those, was 50% of the expected. So maybe it was just bad luck, maybe it was subtle conditions, uh, experimental condition changes, but it doesn't look good for us that, that science can be that irreproducible. We think of science as giving us truths. And if your reproducibility rate is 39%, are we really getting the kind of truths that we think we should be getting? Corporations have done the same thing with our work in, in medical research. In 2011, Bayer reported that 75% of the preclinical studies that they tried to replicate could not be replicated. And they were concerned because they were licensing technologies from schools of medicine and finding that it wasn't doing what it was advertised to do. And 75% of the time, they could not replicate it. Amgen did the experiment in 2012 and announced that they were able to replicate only six of 53 studies in hematology oncology, despite working with the authors. Um, and all of those were major studies, and yet they're not replicatable. This is not good for us. We do not look good. The public sees this. We do not look good. Um, this is um, essentially a graph. There are now five articles that have tried to do the same sort of thing. All of them have found that the reproducibility level is um, you know, 89% non-reproducible to 50%. This is just not OK. The reasons for it, another uh, recent article by Friedman and Cockburn analyzed why it was that the um, preclinical studies could not be replicated. Um, some of them were laboratory protocols that were incomplete in the publication, so sometimes you just couldn't replicate it because you couldn't replicate it. Sometimes it was faulty data analysis or selective reporting 
reporting, for example, secondary endpoints instead of the primary endpoint because the primary endpoint didn't get the result you wanted, so you published the secondary. Uh, in almost a third, the study design was flawed and um, so could not be replicated. And the other big problem that was 35% in these preclinical studies were that the reagents and reference materials were not what they were claimed to be. They were not adequately standardized and checked. So people were basically using something, particularly cell lines, turn out not to be what people thought they were. So the meaning, the meaning is that we need to improve our research methods. All of us, we need to be serious about it. This is a departmental level issue. This is a school level issue. We need to do better science. And somehow we have created a culture that is allowing us to do things that are not to the standard that we would like to hew. Um, we, we need to be careful about the ever, pause, ever present bias towards the positive. People like to see positive results. A positive result may get published. A positive result may get you a grant. And so you tend to select, as soon as you get that positive result, the PO5 is there, you tend to focus on that. And a lot of times that's not a good strategy because it may be just a chance occurrence that you got that PO5. Um, we need to replicate more. We need to do better designed studies. So how should we make our science better? And, and do we really care? I mean, this looks bad, but is it really? Well, yes, it is, because biased research, bad research, means we are putting our patients at risk, because bad research may be the basis both for future experiments that other people try and replicate and can't. Even your own lab may try and replicate and can't. And biased research wastes time and resources. And in the case of clinical research, it may lead to people's deaths because they're following ideas that, in fact, were not right. So it matters that we get this right. There are many potential sources of bias in science. And in fact, the catch is that in, we've always known that. Science is built on principles that are designed to get at investigator bias. So things like control groups, doing double blind masking, um, replicating experiments, doing a pre-specified um, design. And when you do a clinical trial, for example, you'll always have your pre-specified analysis. Well, that's what you should publish. It shouldn't be some secondary analysis. That you've, if you've got a primary endpoint and you've done a study, you should be first publishing the results of that primary endpoint. Um, and then we also use peer review, which clearly hasn't been quite enough. But in spite of those rules, we can see that the problems have occurred. And another theme is financial conflict of interest. And, and to give you two examples to say that financial conflict of interest is a real issue, um, in 2003, Alice Nielsen et al. and JAMA looked at 370 randomized trials. And they looked at the outcome of the trial, did it argue for the experimental treatment and say that it was better than the control or not? And then they looked at the sponsor. And what they found was that when there was a nonprofit sponsor, 16% of the time, the experimental drug won in the comparison with a control group, mostly NIH trials, some foundations. When it was a for-profit organization, 51%. Now, the experimental design is almost certainly drug companies know how to design their studies so that they get the result they want because they're trying to get their drug approved. So a lot of these studies are designed to get approval. But in comparative studies, it is striking how much more often what is published, because there may also be some selection bias, what is published is um, more likely to be positive if it's sponsored by a corporate entity. Um, in 2008, I really like this study, Turner et al. looked at 12 studies of 12 different antidepressants. And there were 12,000 patients in this meta-analysis. And 38 of the studies had positive results reported to the FDA. Of those 38, 37 were published. Only one was not. Of the 36 studies, roughly half the studies, 38 positive, 36 negative, three were published. And 22 were not published at all. And 11 were published with data selection 
So they looked like they were positive. They did a, a publication of a secondary endpoint in most cases. So in the literature, if you were doing something for the Cochrane report, you would find that 94% of the time, antidepressants were infective. If you just look at the published literature, that's what we use. That's how we make our clinical decisions. 50% was actually how often they made a difference, but it would look in the literature like 94%. So we have used the strategy of evidence-based medicine, but things like financial conflicts of interest make it so that our principal sources of information may not be as good as they should be. Another classic example was Merck and their Vigor study. This was one where they compared rofecoxib to naproxen for rheumatoid arthritis. 8,000 patients, similar symptomatic efficacy. So they didn't publish the primary endpoint because it was basically about the same. Um, they looked at GI events, and there were two per um, 100 in rafacoxib, and naproxen had twice as many, 4.5 um, per 100 patient years, twice as bad. However, they did note in the original article that MIs were less common in the naproxen group, less common in the naproxen group. They published the article in the New England, England Journal in 2000, and data was provided supporting Merck's claim that rafecoxib only increased cardiovascular risk in high-risk patients. But then NEJM found on their floppy disk that, that Merck had actually, this was back in the days when we used floppy disks, and when there was an automatic backup generated onto your floppy disk, and the last version of the graph was there, and the last version of the graph, the endpoint went much longer, because all the MIs were happening at the end of the study, so Merck had shortened the study after the fact and submitted to NEJM a graph that had many fewer deaths to MI than actually occurred in the study. Um, and this is to give you a sense of what it looked like. Here was the cumulative incidence of cardiovascular events with rafecoxib against naproxen. There were 47 serious events in the rafecoxib group, 20 in the naproxen group, and in net, um, it prevented 65 upper GI events at the cost of 27 additional thromboembolic events. Now, I ask you, which would you prefer? Would you prefer to have a GI bleed or a heart attack? You might have a preference, and, and they should have let us doctors know, honestly, what the risks and benefits were, because there are some people who couldn't tolerate naproxen, and for them, it may be reasonable to use rafecoxib for Vioxx. But, but they didn't tell us that. They hid it. And in fact, even presented information that was frankly inaccurate and altered in such a way that it was inaccurate. It was dishonest. So at least in this case, they were willing to sacrifice patients for profits. So bias remains a problem. But now let's go to the next big threat, which is funding. And and before the Trump budget proposal, which um, came out, the skinny budget that came out a few weeks ago, um, the NIH budget had been more or less flat since uh, about 2003. I'll show you a curve in a second. And, and with the J uh, inflation adjustment, it had been falling steadily, year by year by year. And, and the result is our pay lines are getting worse and worse and worse. And the ability to do good, creative, research is getting less and less and less, because people are doing the safe work that might get them funded. Now, Trump's budget this year proposed a roughly $6 billion cut in NIH funding, um, which would then make it so that the NIH budget was less than it had been in 2003. So this is what the curves look like. You can see here, you know, back in the 1995, we had the doubling during the Clinton era got to 2003, and here we are, crept up to 32 billion um, promised this year. Actually, we haven't necessarily seen it, but 32 billion, and um, here with infl inflation adjustment, and here's what the proposal is. So I can't be partisan because the AAMC is a nonpartisan 501c3, but I can speak to the issue. And I can say that this is not a budget that would be supportive of what I think is important for America's health, which is to fund and do good research. Um, if this budget came to pass, 
at that sort of number, it would mean essentially no new grants next year. Or um, removing indirect costs, which is what Price, Tom Price, said was likely to be the strategy that they would use to reduce that, you know, if foundations can get by on 10% um, F&A, so can the NIH. Well, um, do you know how much your total funding is, Danny, here on um, 120 million? So you would lose about um, $30 million from your budget. Now, schools of medicine are not revenue generating entities, you know? Are you gonna raise the tuition to make up the $30 million? No. So, so really this would be a devastating blow. Um, and we looked at, I can tell you that Duke's a little bit larger. Ultimately there were 2,100 FTEs that would be lost if they didn't get um, indirect cost payments. So it's a really big deal. And so my encouragement is that we can make a difference. You need to contact your congressman. You need to speak up and defend um, research. Um, it has been a bipartisan issue. Both parties, that's what made this so surprising. Both parties support research because everybody agrees it's good for America. And so where this $6 billion cut is coming from is a really curious thing because both parties have been very supportive of the NIH. It's been a nonpartisan issue. But it's still, we all know how bad it's been. This is, this is pay lines back in the good old days. Uh, you were up at 25, 30%. It was still hard to get NIH funding, but it was practical. Now, you know, we're down around 15%. And, you know, it's a, it, it, it's a crapshoot. It's, it's a real, you know, you, you hope you get funded, but now we're also, we should be thinking about, just to look ahead, we should be thinking about what this means for people's careers and, and the fact that we require people to have grant funding to be able to do research on an arbitrary situation where only 15% of people are getting funding, is this fair? We also are seeing a graying in science. The average scientist uh, working in the United States now is about 50 years old. And um, that was largely the effect of the baby boom and a 1994 law that prohibited forced retirement from universities. Um, and if you look at the NIH funding, older folks are getting more and more of the funding and middle-aged folks and young folks are getting less um, because the people who are established investigators keep getting refunded and, and they don't retire the way once upon a time people retired. They keep going, they keep submitting grants and it meant that younger faculty don't actually have funding sources. So my novel suggestion would be that maybe we should, instead of making tenure lifetime, that when you get your tenure, it's a 30-year contract. So that protects academic freedom, which is the purpose of tenure, but it also, since most people get tenured and are in their mid-30s, sort of says, in your mid-60s, you're not promised the salary forever. Um, at that point, it starts to become an annual contract. And just know that after 30 years of being a tenured faculty member, you will be on an annualized contract with expectations, like a certain amount of teaching, like the potential to cover your costs in research, um, and I think this would be a more constructive way to handle um, faculty tenure issues. Some places are just getting rid of tenure. I actually like this idea a little bit better. Um, there's a cultural skepticism about science that we also need to address and that we all need to take ownership of. There seems to be a sense that scientists are basing their experiments in such a way that they get the results they want. And it's really driven by the scientists' culture, by their politics, or by some economic issue, and that the science is being done to, 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 to message. I mean, that we are doing science, we're not doing it for truth, we're doing it for message. And, and so people stop believing what we say. And, and you know, there's skepticism even about things that really there should be no doubt about, like vaccines save lives. I just cannot believe. I mean, that, that tells you how far the sense that what we are doing is mythology has penetrated the culture, that there are people who, who don't believe, who, who do not trust that, in fact, vaccines lives when it's so, save lives when it's so unequivocally true. So the next aspect of this is if you don't believe what we are doing, 
is true, why fund us to discover it? So if we don't cure this problem of myths and lack of understanding about science, we will have even further challenges in funding than we've had. And the reproducibility question layered on top of this culture issue is a really existential threat for science as we have been doing it. So I've listed the challenges, reproducibility and bias, finances, an aging workforce. What can we do about these things? Well, let's start with the bias and reproducibility issue. I think this requires two different ways of responding. First is a cultural shift, and second is an institutional responsibility and an institutional shift. So the culture is that we need to return to more of those basic principles that, that we learned when we first became scientists, but that seem to be being observed too often in the breach. Um, we need to have pre-specified experiments that we follow through. We are not looking, we are not doing enough animals until we get a positive p-value. It's a pre-specified experiment with a pre-specified power calculation and we know what we're doing. And if we have an observation that is novel and surprising, we do it again. And we repeat it with a new pre-specified experiment that, um, that makes sure that, that the experiment is valid, that the new observation is valid. So we need good controls. We need well-validated reagents instead of using um, uh, chemical or, or cell lines that we've just used because we've used them. We need to do the, the steps to go ahead and do the DNA analysis to confirm that it is, in fact, the cell line that we thought it was. Um, we need to be careful to publish accurate methods and complete data because we want to encourage replication. Replication is our friend. Replication builds the confidence in what we are doing. And we want people to have confidence in what we are doing. And, and we need our lab directors to be able to be really engaged. And our current system of 15% pay line, project by project funding, has meant that our PIs are basically just grant writing machines. And they're not working in a lab. And they don't know their work. And, and things happen that get out of control that they don't even know. And people are not getting the instruction they need. So we need to figure out how to protect our PIs so they have time to mentor. And they need to set up regular lab meetings so that there's peer peer review within the lab because that makes it stronger. And regular lab meetings and presentations of works in progress because what we get caught by are systematic errors and our peers can find those systematic errors that we may not notice in our own work. Institutions need to be providing adequate biostatistical report support. I think they're one of the major flaws in the way we've been doing research is we just don't have, we have gone to a biostatistical model and, and a t-test is not the answer to every scientific question. So we need to consider um, providing more biostatistical support to our basic science investigators all the way through to clinical investigators. Um, we should be looking to audit periodically labs to make sure that they are doing things well. And so we should have a regular structured process of sampling labs, because just knowing that somebody's going to look at their work makes people behave better, or could look at their work. Um, we need adequate power calculations before any animal or human subjects experiment. And we also need to change the promotion criteria so that people stop feeling driven to churn out article after article. And instead, we should ask that people, that the review committees only look at probably five best, most impactful articles. Because what you want to reward is excellence, not number of least publishable units. It's not volume, it's quality that matters. And so we need to change the criteria and make it so that we focus on the quality. And the other thing to note is that grants are so arbitrary, it's hardly fair to use those as a promotion criteria because when people are shooting at a 15% pay line, it's just not fair because it's too arbitrary. People are being selected on, on capricious um, elements in their grant application, not the quality of the science. The funding challenge, the Trump budget, would, as, as it exists, would be a disaster. So we, community-wide, need to be lobbying. We need to talk to our Congress people. We need to talk um, with... Um, the executive branch, we need to talk to our community so they understand our science. We need to humanize our science. 
Um, and one option you can use, there's something called aamcaction.org, where we organize for you um, times when we think it's important to send things and we give you the templates and how to reach your congressperson and we help you do it. So if you're interested, that is a one way to be able to have your voice heard in Washington. But I think it's critical at this point because we're gonna be going through a war over how much funding science gets. And it's important for the entire community to be there together saying, this matters to people's lives. Um, what we would like for the NIH is predictable funding at a reasonable level. We would like to know in advance how much. We don't like this year, for example, because Congress could not agree on a budget, there's been a continuing resolution. The NIH doesn't know how much money they have to spend. So they cut back, because their budget could still be cut. I mean, with, with no knowledge of what the budget is, the budget could even be cut. So um, they hope that, um, that, that in April 28th, they have to have a new budget in place. It'll either be a continuing resolution to the end of the year, or it will be a new budget. Now, the agreed upon HHS budget had a $2 billion increase for NIH which we thought was reasonable because that's a little bit more than inflation and starts to catch up on these years of being behind. But it's basically just barely over inflation. And so we wanted that and that could still happen. So again, that's something to speak to your congressperson about. Please approve the 2017 um, NIH authorization because it was justified. And it was bipartisan. I mean, the Appropriations Committee on both sides agreed that the $2 billion increase was a reasonable amount. Um, we do not want to have a long discussion about the administration's $1.2 billion proposed cut for that 2017 budget or the $5.8 billion cut for 2018 because that's the wrong discussion. The right discussion was we would like to have nice, steady increases. We would like to see the originally budgeted $34 billion for 2017 and a $2 billion increase for 2018. And, and we would like to speak to the appropriators to that effect. And, you know, it's the task of Sisyphus to have to keep pushing. Wouldn't it be better if they just did a five-year budget, you know, and gave the NIH some reasonable level of growth so that the poor folks who are at the NIH were trying to figure out how to you know, what RFAs to send out, what grants to give out. They don't even know how much money they have. It, it's, they're in a terrible bind. Um, so for you, humanize your science. Those of you who are scientists or doctors, talk to your neighbors about your science. Make people aware that that's what you do, that that's what you care about. Um, learn to do an elevator speech. Every, everybody in research should have an elevator speech, a short, concise, um, understandable um, lecture that you could give in, a, in the duration of an elevator ride to somebody explaining why, uh, what you do and why it matters. And it does matter. Um, and it's also time for some deep culture work for us in our world to get rid of the bias issues. So in summary, in spite of the challenges that I listed, it really is an amazing time with amazing stuff going on. I saw the lab today. I mean, you're, you know, the, the, the huge um, BSL-4 and BSL-3 lab. I mean, it's just an amazing facility that you work in. And, and the ID research that's coming out of Galveston is just remarkable. I mean, it's so cool. And it's making difference in people's lives. And so you should go home feeling really good that you're in an institution that's making a difference. We need to share that joy. We need to feel that joy, because there have always been barriers. Um, funding has always been cyclical. It will always be cyclical. Um, and, and we need to go ahead and say, you know, even though we're in up and down cycles, what we do matters, and we're just going to ride through it, um, because what we do really does matter. We are saving lives, and we should feel good about that. So thank you for listening, and I am open to any questions anybody may have. There are two microphones that people can have if you have a question so that we can get it onto the video um, that was made. So if you have questions, they can give you a microphone. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment, uh, you had a bullet point there on 
uh, never exaggerate. And um, I was, you know, when I was um, a few years ago when they had this joint announcement that the human genome has been decoded, um, and that was the US and the UK together, first of all, that wasn't true. Yep. And uh, second of all, uh, they were promising so many things so quickly. Um, so I think that's something that the NIH was guilty of. Uh, and, and, you know, it's at every level of science. And I was wondering if you could just comment on how to not exaggerate and still convey enthusiasm. Yeah, and it's, it, it happens all the time. I mean, breakthrough is an overused word. As soon as you see the word breakthrough, you're, the first thing you should have is your salt shaker in hand because you know, you're gonna have to take it with at least a grain of salt because most of the time it is an exaggeration. So we need to be clear about the truth of where we sit. And I realize some of it's to try and convince the public, but the public's getting jaded. They can see that we are exaggerating things. And, and so I personally think we just need to be careful um, because that's, the human genome wasn't done when they were telling us that the human genome was done. And we are still working on it. But on the other hand, Things like the skid treatment, you know, that's the product of understanding the human genome. It's cool, and it's taken a little bit of time, but it's really cool. And, and our cancer chemotherapies and immunotherapies, well, they're better than what we had, but they aren't yet as far enough to make, we're not curing huge numbers using this. On the other hand, we have diseases, um, Gleevec, you know, keeps people alive for years. Um, so we're making, we're making differences, but we should focus and be clear about where it's a little step and where it's a big step. And what we are on the trail of, it's okay to say, but we shouldn't be claiming a breakthrough when all we really are is at the beginning of a road that's going to lead to somewhere that we want to get to. I agree. I enjoyed your speech very much. I wanted to follow up a little bit on the issue of publication bias, uh, because you really talk about how negative studies never see the light of day. Some of that may be because of uh, industry not wanting to share that their drug doesn't work. But the other side of the coin is that uh, many journals will not accept a negative study because uh, you don't know necessarily that things were done properly or the controls were interpreted correctly or, and it's just flawed because it's negative. So is the AAMC doing anything with regards to trying to come up with alternative mechanisms for why or how you could potentially publish a negative result? Uh, because it certainly won't ever get, appear in New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA or anything like that. So what really are... Actually, NEGM has been publishing you... many more negative studies okay. lately. Okay. Yeah, I mean, actually, I think that's the, what really has to happen. And then the other side of this, perhaps, so um, is, is there a way, perhaps, of coming up with um, um, places or repositories for negative studies uh, that, that may not necessarily be peer-reviewed, but, but may be things that could be jointly accessed by the scientific community in order to be able to yep. balance out uh, sort of uh, these sorts of negative... In, in clinical research, I think it's going to happen. I mean, I think between clintrials.gov when they finally work out the bugs. And, and the fact that we're gonna, more and more journals are gonna expect you to put the data, the NIH is gonna expect you to put the data into a repository. They're trying to figure out how to make that work. Yeah. But I think for clinical trials information, we're gonna see more and more of that because you can often, even if an individual study may not have done what you hoped, it may be part of a meta-analysis that may be able to give us um, an answer. But, you know, you still have to get it into a standard format so it's interpretable. There's metadata that's got to go with it. Um, and, and how often are the negative studies just because they were underpowered or done badly? And how many people do the analysis to know that they were underpowered or done badly? And part of what I like is both New England Journal and JAMA have increased the number of um, articles they're publishing that are well done well-executed but negative studies um, that make a difference in how we provide care. So there isn't an easy answer other than we have to establish systems and repositories that are standardized enough that somebody could interpret them without having to wade through mountains of metadata to understand what they mean. So I'm going to follow up on Dr. Brazier's question. 
What is your take on uh, open access journal? So now the issue of reproducibility comes into play, issue of uh, publishing negative study comes into play, and I saw you have few slides from open access journal in your, public, in your presentation mm -hmm. to today. What's your comment on open access journals? Um, I have ambivalence, so I'm, I'm a little bit of a heretic. Um, I have ambivalence about open access journals because most of them uses their model uh, a fee for publication. So for them, they succeed when they publish a lot. And you submit, you pay your, your fee, and if they reject it, you're not going to send to that journal again. So it gets harder and harder to get people to buy into going to those open access journals. And we're seeing a lot of sloppiness and, and a lot of bad journals being you know, that are open access in the whole omics world. You know, there's a, the family of publications which got taken out of Scopus because people realized that there was a lot of bogus work being published. It's really hard to know. I think the PLOS family, which was very well economically supported by a foundation at the start, probably comes closer. But I worry that the focus on, on payment creates a model that, that has conflict of interest at its core and changes the equation around how judgments are made in the peer review process. Uh, that the editors want to publish more because they want to get more submissions because their journal makes more money when they get more submissions. Um, so I kind of like actually the old model where um, it wasn't pay at the time of submission. Um, and where the peer review process happened. And if there was payment, it was after a peer review process. I like that better. Um, but we're, we're, on the other hand, I also like the fact that for much of the world, when it's an open access journal, everybody can see it. And, and that's a good thing. The fact that people don't have to pay for expensive subscriptions to be able to get access to what's happening in science is a good thing. So this is one of those where there are competing values on both sides. And I just worry that what we see is a decrease in quality because of the model, but, but I see the, the value in both sides. One more question, Yes, I very much enjoyed your talk, very practical for such a complicated subject. I had a question about um, NIH peer review uh, process and how does, you know, obviously with a 50% funding line, it's so stringent and as to be arbitrary, as you mentioned, but uh, how does the, uh, the study sections police themselves for a conflict of interest? And I say this because sometimes I've seen and experienced uh, myself and colleagues that there are things in reviews that are just absolutely wrong, and so you, it's hard to, to know how to, you know, uh, put those into the processor. Um, it's complicated. You hope people are being honest, and the, the worst conflicts are not the financial conflicts. So often what the NIH chases are dumb stuff, like is this person, were you ever at that institution, and so could you connect this as an institution to institution thing? Um, often it's just what your ideas are that you've spent your whole career defending, and somebody else has got an alternative hypothesis, you're gonna be really skeptical about that grant, and in fact, if it's an alternative hypothesis, you might do what you could to make sure that that didn't get funded. So, so there are conflicts of interest, but they're often on the science grounds. And I, I hope, but I am not convinced that, that the um, program officers are aware enough to monitor that in the peer review process. Um, it's, it is complicated. Peer review is always gonna be complicated because people have access to grind. We are human beings and, and we do human things. Thank you. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.